I want you to imagine for a moment if Tom Brady had some blowout with the Bucks, decided to retire from play, and then immediately take the first head coaching vacancy he could find. I wonder, in this day and age, with this news cycle and social media, how all of that would go down. But something like that happened a lot, and it was the very first coach of the Minnesota Vikings. Let me tell you a story here in the Lockdown Vikings podcast. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, 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 everybody, to another episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, your pal, in the Kitty Copied Off in Math class. My name is Luke Braun. You can find me on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL. You can find the show on Twitter at Locked On Vikings. And thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. On today's show, we are continuing our little story time series talking about the history of the Vikings going back to the olden days. Um, I, there will still be X's and O's and more uh, classic stuff. I do have one piece of news that I think is worth at least chit-chatting about a little bit. Um, and we'll start with that. But mostly, I want to talk about the very beginning. But first things first, let's talk about what's going on right now. Cameron Dantzler talked to reporters a little bit on Thursday, and he revealed he's at buck 90 now. Uh, for those unfamiliar, Cam Dantzler came into the Combine. I think he weighed around 190 at the Combine, but it was like all bad weight. And he was... Like he had like the worst BMI at the complex at the whole combine or something like that. And it was very clear, like his college listed him as like at like 175, which is way too light. And that would be like, I don't know if I can draft you light. And so it, to me, it seems pretty clear that somebody told him to gain weight. And so he gained weight really, really fast. I don't think he did so responsibly. He didn't build muscle. He might have gained bad weight. And then he totally torpedoed all of his drills. His 40 times sucked. His his three cones sucked. He played a lot faster than that 40 time showed. He did like one on Instagram where he supposedly ran like a 4 3. I don't know how much stock I put into that, but he, he wasn't a 4 6 corner. All that said, he played pretty well his rookie year at the beginning. I mean, especially, especially he had a very good camp. He was like one of the better corners in camp in his rookie year after he had shed all that bad weight and he was a little better. But obviously that didn't last, and then he regressed a little bit last year as he came in a little bit bulkier, and did he lose his speed, and now he's even bulkier than that. And so it's interesting. Um, he also claims that he's faster, though, and maybe if he gained that weight, you know, the right way over a long time with, you know, dedication and, and hard work and, and really kind of slowly grinding his way up, um, then maybe he just gained a little more muscle and he can play a more uh, normal game. And I think that's certainly a possibility but uh, I, I don't know if that reflects like what we hoped for from him, um, though I am curious to see how he fares in this new uh, Ed Donatel scheme. But we kind of just have to wait for camp and for actual game action to see that. Until then, let's keep talking about the olden days. Um, for those of you who joined Vikings fandom, you know, after the 60s, uh, you might not be as familiar with the first guy. Everybody's really familiar with the second guy. That's Bud Grant. We all know him. But we're not as familiar with Norm Van Brocklin. And so I kind of wanted to talk about him and his tenure and what he means to the Vikings um, and kind of what we can learn, I guess, from his tenure. But really, first, I want to tell you the story of how he became the Vikings coach. The short version is he was buddies with their first GM. The Vikings' first GM was a guy named Burt Rose, who worked for the Rams for a long time, and uh, Norm Van Brocklin was the quarterback of the Rams at that time. They got to know each other, they were pals, and uh, Burt Rose brought in a friend. As an aside, uh, Bud Grant was actually up for that job, and some sources say he turned it down, some sources say Burt Rose hired a friend instead, it's disputed, uh, but either way, could have had Bud Grant in the early 60s. But... It's a little more complicated than that. Um, Norm Van Brocklin was 
widely thought of as one of, if not the greatest quarterbacks to ever play the game back in 1960. And you got to remember, the 40s and 50s were not a time of quarterbacks. That was a time of running backs and wing tee and defenders and tough and gritty. And football wasn't the spectacle it is today. It wasn't analyzed as, uh, like, with as much dedication. It wasn't met with all this fanfare. Um, it was, I mean, the games were on TV, you'd, you'd hear about it in the paper, who won what game and stuff, but it, it, to me it was more of a thing you bought tickets and maybe you'd go to a game and it would be a fun thing to do on a Sunday afternoon, and less of a an identity. Um, all that is to say, Norm Van Brocklin was part of, I think, the acceleration of football into what it was today, because Norm Van Brocklin was a pocket passer. Um, when, when you think of pocket passers, you might think of that as a sort of outdated thing. Now it was cutting edge when he was, and he was like the best at it. He won two NFL championships, including handing Vince Lombardi, his only ever playoff loss in 1959. And that was as quarterback of the Eagles for the Eagles. He was a little bit of like a player coach. He, called his own plays. It was like a very early Peyton Manning vibes where he would call his own plays at the line of scrimmage. He knew all the playbooks and stuff, and he was sort of offensive coordinator and quarterback, which was not an unprecedented thing back then. Um, and that, I think, gave him the leeway to sort of negotiate his way in with the Eagles to be the head coach. Their coach, Buck Shaw, was getting up there, was getting ready to retire, and he was going to be the successor. And then a shakeup in ownership that happened because somebody got sick meant that it was new people in charge and those new people didn't want Norm Van Brocklin to be the full-on head coach. They said, we're going to keep you as player coach a little bit. We're going to ease you in. We're going to make the transition a little bit more smoothly and be more a little more patient about it. Yeah, we're, we're good to have you be the coach eventually, but for now, we're going to still kind of leave you in this limbo, this secondary position. Norm Van Brocklin hated that. He w was lied to. He said, hey, you guys told me something different. You And a, a lot of people say, uh, in Philadelphia, a lot of people say, nobody told Norm about that. I don't know how he got that idea. I think it was more just a misunderstanding, miscommunication. Um, but either way, Norm Van Brocklin was done with him. And he said, eh, screw you guys. I'm done. And he went and called up his old pal, Burt Rose, and said, yeah, I will take that coaching job. And that's how the Vikings got their first coach. His time in Minnesota was tumultuous. But a lot of players have fond memories of him. A lot of players couldn't stand him. He was a tough guy to figure out. I want to talk it out with y'all. Uh, but first, let me talk to you about my new morning routine. You know, wake up, cry, as any God-fearing Vikings fan does, and then take a scoop of AG1 by Athletic Greens. Just mix that stuff in a cup of water. Um, it is great for your gut health. Gut health is something that is neglected in too many people. It's a very good way to help with your energy, to help with, you know, appetite, to help with all sorts of great things. And vitamin, certain vitamins and, and probiotics and antigens and stuff like that will help your body regulate itself in a way that it doesn't necessarily do naturally, especially if you're someone that takes a lot of vitamins in the morning or something. AG1 can be all of that in one scoop. And it tastes pretty good, too. So to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NFL Network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NFL Network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Thanks again for making Lockdown Vikings your first listen of the day. Hey, make sure you go check out Lockdown Sports today. They will be covering all the major stories, and boy, howdy, there sure are some. There's some, <laughs> what a plug. There's some playoff stuff. There's weird, weird stuff going on in Las Vegas and in Washington here in the NFL. Um, all sorts of great stuff. Go check out Locked On Sports today, wherever you find your favorite shows. I want to talk about the Norm Van Brocklin era. Um, if you Google him, honestly, I like. I know a lot of you probably know more about Norm Van Brocklin as a Falcon from the secret base. Falcons documentary had a whole big long diatribe on Norm Van Brocklin and how he was this like total crankster and how 
Uh, maybe he was misunderstood and how he challenged all the reporters in the room to a fight, which is how he got ousted in Atlanta. And that's very on brand for him. His time in Minnesota, I don't think was quite as complicated. It was, I mean, I'm sure it was right. Everybody's a lot more than what gets written about in the papers. Um, but a lot of players just didn't like playing for this guy. And it was really because of how hard he was on you, but he wasn't tough on you out of a, 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 a place of love. Bud Grant was tough on the, on those players, but everybody knew it came from a place of love. With Norm, I don't know if people knew it came from a place of love. It felt like it, it came from a place of, we are all a group of tough men, and this is your initiation. And if you can't hack it, you're out. To Norm's credit, he was very often dealing with non-football players. Like, these guys were not professional football players for the first few years. It was an expansion team, and they had a few football players that they got in their expansion drafts and their college drafts, but that didn't fill out the roster for camp. For, I don't know if it was, I don't think it was 90 back then, but for like their version of a 90 man roster, they brought in bartenders and truck drivers and like whoever needed the two week paycheck. And so I, I think that toughness and that, that grueling boot camp thing was part of a strategy to kind of weed out the week. And look, some of those guys worked out. I mean, Lonnie Warwick was a linebacker for the Vikings for a lot of their like dynasty. And he was just like one of those construction workers. <laughs> Maybe one of the funniest ways that this manifested itself was with the rolling. Uh, whenever you got in trouble in Norm Van Brocklin's training camp, you had to go from one end of the field to the other just rolling like you'd lay down on your side and you'd have to roll like you were rolling down a hill from one end of the field to the other. Now, if you have time or a backyard or a access to a park and you don't care about people looking at you weird, I want you to try to do this in a straight line. And I would love for you to get somebody in your life to take a video of that and send it to me because that is impossible. Um, in his book, Carl Kosolke, which I talked about a lot yesterday, uh, details a fun little time where he had to do this and he started on the goal line and he started rolling and he's like, I've been going for a while. How far am I? And he was back on the goal line. He had done a full on 180. Um, this was the kind of thing that Norm Van Brocklin did. He would discipline players, but I think more importantly, he would chew you out all the time. And he was a, a super loud mouth, potty mouth kind of guy. And, and he was at a, he had the gift of profanity, uh, and he had the gift of insults. I mean, he knew everything there was about you and he knew how to like get at your core. He called Mick Tinglehoff like worthless farm boy stuff. He called all his players stiffs and dogs. You know, he said, you guys are worthless. He was mean. <laughs> and, uh, some players understood that this is just this guy trying to toughen us up. And it was a very old school masculinity kind of thing. But a lot of players just thought this dude is just kind of being a jerk for no reason. And they didn't want to play for him. And a lot of players just kind of didn't want to come in to play for this stupid guy. Most importantly, Fran Tarkenton. And the beef between Norm Van Brocklin and Fran Tarkenton might be the thing you know about Norm Van Brocklin, if you were familiar with him at all before listening to this show. But for those who aren't, I want to tell you that story because A, it's delicious drama. Uh, but B, I think it tells you something about the attitude that led the Vikings down the path they went down, especially with Bud Grant. So let's talk about that. When Bud Grant first got to the Vikings, he thought of the Vikings as pirates. They were passionate, they had camaraderie, but they were loose and they were undisciplined and they were sloppy and uh, they were ill-mannered. And Bud Grant really tried to turn them into soldiers, you know. Um, and that pirate thing was because the pirate captain was Norm Van Brocklin, former player uh, with all of the bad habits and bad manners that bugged Bud Grant so much. And I think that filtered in through the team. Um, Fran Tarkenton was the son of a Methodist minister, Georgia boy, super conservative, didn't like to swear, didn't like to get in too much trouble. I mean, he wasn't like a total square, like he would go out and party a little bit, but he didn't like that about Norm Van Brocklin. And Norm Van Brocklin didn't like Fran Tarkenton. 
I think it was more personal between these two guys than most of the ink tells us. Most of what you'll hear if you read any books or if you go look at any of the old accounts or if you just listen to Fran Tarkenton talk about it, I mean, he'll probably talk your ear, about it, ear off about it today if you asked him, was Norm Van Brocklin didn't like how Fran Tarkenton played. Tarkenton, we know him, he's, he's the scrambler, right? And he wasn't really the scrambler as much in college. In college, I mean, he was mobile and they did sprint outs with him and stuff, but there aren't as many highlights of him in college just like totally winging it and playing schoolyard ball and looking like a modern day Patrick Mahomes running around. Um, that was a thing in the pros and he actually talks about that. There was a game, a preseason game his first year, the Vikings first year, 1961, against the Bears where he got hit a whole bunch. The Bears really kicked their ass because the Bears were really mad about some other stuff. Go listen to the schedule release episode if you want that story. Um, but Tarkenton was like, well, that sucked. I didn't like getting hit very much. What if next time I just didn't? And then he decided to be a scrambler. At least that's how he tells it. I don't think that that decision happened as suddenly, but that's how he tells it. So when Fran Tarkenton went out in the first regular season game, when he first really decided to debut this new strategy of running away from people instead of taking sacks, uh, I th that might have caught Ben Brocklin off guard a little bit. That might have led to why Fran Tarkenton didn't start in that game. Maybe there was some dialogue about that. Um, either way, it's well documented that Norm Van Brocklin didn't like this about Fran Tarkenton. He was a pocket passer. Norm Van Brocklin was the pocket passer. I, I like to try to put this in today's terms, and I think about that world where Tom Brady becomes a head coach, and Tom Brady has been watching Lamar Jackson's and Patrick Mahomes's and stuff, and then some, some new rookie comes in and says, nah, I think being a pocket statue's the good idea. Like, the coach, the, the coach ain't gonna like that. <laughs> And if you ask Norm, it just wasn't the way you did things. It is a very old-fashioned way of thinking, you know. It's a very 1960s. In 1965, you know, we don't do stuff like that. That's just not the way it's done. Was a much more compelling argument than it is now. And, I mean, both of these guys were fairly headstrong personalities. So these disagreements just sort of got icier and icier and icier until they finally came to a head uh, in 1966. Um, Norm had... Norm had resigned once, and I guess I should tell you that story. In 1965, he, uh, after a particularly bad loss, he pulls aside a bunch of reporters and he says, I'm going to resign. And he tells the reporters before he tells anybody on the team, and the Vikings are totally blindsided by this. But the Vikings don't want their coach to just, like, up and leave. So they also, like, understand that Norm Van Brocklin was a very wishy-washy guy, and he would change his mind a lot. You know, he did that to the Eagles. He changed his mind on who he was going to start at quarterback in the first game. He changed his mind on on all sorts of stuff. And he was a he was a sort of unpredictable and, and merc mercurial guy. And they all kind of thought, you know, I think we can sit him down and have a talk. And so they did. They sat him down and they said, maybe don't resign and maybe come back. And it was it had been, I think, a couple of days. And then suddenly he came back, much to the bewilderment of the players who heard Norm Van Brocklin was gone. And I mean, they were literally dancing in the parking lot like they were so happy to be rid of this guy. And then he comes back and he goes back into his office, pulls him into the most awkward meeting they must have had ever and said, nope, I'm still your coach. Let's uh, get out there for practice. And needless to say, 65 and 66 did not go very well. But in 66, things between Van Brocklin and Fran Tarkenton came to a head. Now, there are a ton of different accounts of this story, and I think piecing them together, I have a decent understanding of them, but some of these details are very much disputed. So here's the legend, the best that I know it. Fran Tarkenton had a particularly bad game. I want to say it was against the Colts, and he got benched in that game, and he threw like four picks in that game. It seemed like a warranted benching, but I don't know. I mean, we've seen really established quarterbacks get benched before. I mean, imagine if, if Kirk Cousins threw three picks in a game and got benched for Sean Mannion. I kind of feel like we would all be up in arms over that. As, as bad as he can play, why would you put Sean Mannion in? And that's sort of what that seems like it felt like, or, or like when Ben McAdoo benched Eli Manning, where it's it's more about what's the best way to, to finish out the fourth quarter of this blowout loss. It's like a matter of respect. It's a matter of your placement on the team and then the hierarchy. And that was it 
for Fran Tarkenton, who had been basically told not to play like he knew how he could play, not to be himself, who had bristled with this coach for years and half a decade. I mean, it's it was this, that was it. That was the last straw. And so he was going to demand a trade. So he goes into Norm Van Brocklin's office and basically tells him the story. He's like, I don't want to play for you anymore. I am done. And that's that. And as Fran Tarkenton tells it, he was done. He, he was absolutely not going to hear any pleas or, or any negotiation. It was over. The conversation lasted about five minutes. It was very cold and icy, and that was that. After a certain point in that year, Van Brocklin just stopped coaching Tarkenton. He just wouldn't speak to him. And I, I think it's really funny. You, know, you go to the, the narrative this year about Zimmer and Kirk Cousins and how they like only started watching tape together this last year. They would still interact, though. I mean, they'd be in meetings and it was amicable and all that stuff. And it's just maybe he wasn't spending as much time as we wish. With Van Brocklin and Tarkenton, it was nothing. It was the cold shoulder. And this is a very Van Brocklin move. You're, you're on my bad side and I don't want anything to do with you. And I would rocket you to the moon if I could. Um, so Tarkenton's fed up with this. And he goes into Van Brocklin's office. Conversation lasts about five minutes and he says, I'm done with you. I'm not going to play with, for you anymore. I am done with this team. I'm done with you. I'm going to go and demand a trade. Um, and the GM was Jim Finks by then. And he knew about this dynamic and this conversation. And, and Van Brocklin said not much about it, and they very much didn't work anything out. So imagine Fran Tarkenton's surprise when the next day he gets a call from Jim Finks, who is elated at how the two of them worked everything out. I'm glad you guys are going to be able to work together in the future, <laughs> which Fran Tarkenton was like, what? That's not how that conversation went at all. And I don't know why you think it did. And Jim Finks lets out an, oh my God, I have to call you back, which I think is the funniest part of this story, because it sounds like something you would say if something like this had happened before. I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into it. Uh, but after that, it wasn't long before Van Brocklin resigned and Fran Tarkenton was traded to the Giants. There was a moment where Tarkenton could have probably taken his words back and stayed with the Vikings, but he kind of thought, ah, the damage is done. I've already demanded a trade. I need a fresh start. Even though the coach is gone, I need to go to the Giants. And it, the, his time with the Giants wasn't much better. He never made the playoffs. He only had one winning season there, and he only had one winning season in Minnesota, and he eventually ended up demanding a trade from the Giants back to the Vikings, where all of his old friends played, and now they were good. This was, you know, after the 69 season, where they went to uh, the Super Bowl, 1771. They were the one seed in the NFC. Absolutely a place where Fran Tarkenton, who was just desperate to be on a competitive team, totally wanted to go back to, and it really was only Norm Van Brocklin, but because of that feud, we were robbed of possibly five years of QB excellence. And if you look at the 70 season, the 71 season, the, the seasons after Joe Cap, uh, that was bleak at the quarterback position. They had a punter combo named Bob Lee starting playoff games. I mean, it was rough. And I, I, I have to think, I cannot help but wonder what those seasons would have been like when the defense was still just as good as it was in 69. And maybe if they had a quarterback, something would have been a little different. I mean, it wouldn't have been the offenses of the, the mid seventies with Chuck Borman and John Gilliam and all these cool dudes still though. I mean, Gene Washington was no slouch. Stu Boyd was in the building. Um, I don't know. I, I try not to get too speculative, but I kind of feel like speculative about it. You know, what would have happened if that feud didn't go down the way that it did. Uh, anyways, it's hard to figure out Norm Van Brocklin. And I, I guess the people who wrote about him were a lot more patient with him than we are with coaches today. And I think if he were a coach today, he probably would have uh, a tenure that matched Urban Myers a little bit. I don't think it would have worked out as well. And he died in, in the early 80s, and he never really got to see the league evolve into like what it is. And honestly, I, I think the dude would probably turn inside out if he watched like Lamar Jackson play a game. So maybe that's for the best. But whatever it is you think of Norm Van Brocklin, somebody had to fall on the grenade of being the guy that presided over the half-built roster that could only win two games a year that the Vikings started out as, which every expansion team starts out as. Somebody's got to fall on that grenade. 
you look at every expansion team over over the years, none of them are good right away, except for the Jags and Panthers because they made the rules really weird for those two two teams, and then suddenly they were like juggernauts right off the bat. Uh, but anyways, I will see you all next week. I'll try to do a little more X's and O's stuff um, next week, but we are, you know, I mean, we're in the middle of the summer, so it's going to be a lot of story times. I hope you guys like this stuff. I will see you all tomorrow, and as always, skull.